I welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hi, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr, and I am the Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased to have all of you with us today. Um, it's a different time zone than we normally hold our webinars, and we're so we're very pleased that, that many of you may be with us for the first time. So welcome. Um, Today we have Milica Stankovic, who's going to be speaking about seagrass in Southeast Asia, the status, blue carbon potential, and recent trends. Milica is from, from the Prince of Songkhla University. Um, and she'll be taking over in just a minute to let you know how the webinar will work. We'll have Milica presenting um, first, and then we'll have dedicated time for questions afterwards. Um, but you may send in questions for Melita at any point during the webinar. You can send in your questions by typing them into the question panel of the user interface. It's the Q and it says Q and A, or you can type them into the chat. With the chat, you can choose whether the chats are directed at just Melita and I, or you can send them to all the attendees. We may also at some point be asking for input um, from you about the status of seagrass in your area um, or and other things. And you may, sh again, share that with just Melissa and I or with all the attendees. We just ask that anything that you put in the chat that you send to everyone, that you keep it on the topic and professional. Um, and thank you, Melissa, for being here. We uh, I'll turn it over to you now. We're, we're, we're very glad you were able to be here to present today. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share the screen. Welcome, everyone. And thank you, Sarah, for having me here. Uh, and I'm so glad that I will be able to share uh, the work that we do. Okay, I think you should be having a full screen now. Okay. It's, it's, it's now are. full screen. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you everyone for um, coming. Um, so I will be sharing uh, part of the work um, that I do in my lab, but also what, what we as a whole do in the lab because it's a joint effort. Um, and I will focus the status of the, the seagrass in Southeast Asia as the region, and then uh, with the global carbon potential as that is my uh, specialty. And then I, will, I really want all of your inputs later on uh, when we come to the recent trends. Hmm. Uh, so just to introduce briefly, um, so I am coming from Prince of Songkhla University, which is uh, in the south, south, is your point? Okay, so which is in south um, of Thailand, um, in from Hat Yai. Um, we current we have two research units. The first one is the seaweed and seagrass research unit, uh, which belongs to the Faculty of Science and Department of Biology. Um, and we do all kinds of um, different work. So this is the picture from a few years ago. Uh, we have a few more new students coming in and uh, research assistants. So it's the work. So everyone does a different type of work. I work on low carbon. Um, we have people working on seaweeds. Uh, we have people working on uh, seagrass ecology. Uh, we have a person working on dugongs, food webs, and, and so on. Um, the other um, research research unit that I also belong to is Dugong and Seagrass research, uh, research Station, which is a new one. Um, it also belongs to Prince of Songkhla University, and it is divided. <clears throat> excuse me, and it is divided into scientific research, where people from Faculty of Science come in. Um, where it is me and uh, one more lecturer working on dugongs. We have four students so far and two research assistants. And the second, the another part is from veterinary care and research for marine mammals, focusing mostly on dugongs. 
Um, so seagrass is, so this is the global map of South of seagrass in Southeast Asia. I'm sure that you all have, you all have seen this. Um, so seagrasses are distributed globally. There are more than 70 species and they distribute on 159 con uh, countries in six different continents. And the area is between 30 to 60 million hectares, which is approximately 0.1% uh, of the ocean floor. And I circled um, our region, Southeast Asia, because it is a diversity hotspot, global diversity hotspot, where we, um, for, on this map, it's about 10 to 15 species, but um, the, the, the regional um, database counts much more species. So the seagrass area in Southeast Asia covers about 3.66 million hectares, which hasn't been verified yet. Uh, it is a rough, really rough assumption, uh, which represents between six to 12% of the global seagrass area. And if you look in terms of the coastline, the seagrass cover about 22.3% of, of, of all coastline um, from all the countries in the region. And the highest um, area, the highest known area so far are in the Philippines and Indonesia. But again, um, the maps of seagrasses are very uh, limited and scarce. So these numbers are very rough um, and we are working uh, towards updating them. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, this, the highest number of species uh, in some countries goes up to 19, 19 uh, which is the example in the which is example in the Philippines. Um, then we have follow up with 16 in, in uh, Indonesia um, and then uh, 14 in Vietnam and Thailand now currently has 14 as well. Um, so um, this is the paper from 2018. Uh, so some of the species uh, have changed a bit too. Um, most of the seagrasses are are located um, in shallow coastal waters, and we can see them intertidal and subtidal. Um, in Thailand, most of the seagrasses are, are intertidal, uh, and we have some, but not many subtidal meadows. And they are distributed as a single species meadow versus a multiple species where I circled, we have about three species, but I think there are more on this photo. Um, and uh, the complexity of multi multi species meadows can go four or five um, combinations. Um, and as you all know, seagrass ecosystems they provide multiple multiple services um, to global biodiversity, home to many marine home to many marine animals, nursery ground to many uh, valuable um, and important fish fishes, and also very a lot of economic species. But they also provide food. Um, food um, to like uh, dugongs and sea turtles and also other uh, smaller smaller animals. But besides that, um, they decrease uh, water velocity, um, they produce oxygen, um, they cycle the water, they provide coastal protection. And, um, and what we are going to focus today is the carbon, carbon storage and carbon provide a great, a big carbon sink. Um, in 2018, a review came um, about uh, what has been known um, and the themes of the research um, in, our, in our area. Um, and it divided into climate change, conservation and management, genetics, connectivity, physiology, and mapping. And um, basically it kind of put the guidelines of the future research, what should it be? Because a lot of research in our in this area up to 2019 um, has been very descriptive and very limited. Um, so today I will focus mostly on the climate change and the blue carbon with some reflection about the mapping because one doesn't go without the other one. Um, so for mapping, I'll just touch base on it um, as it's, it can be a completely separate webinar. Um, the natural carbon sinks occur in um, any type of ecosystems. Um, is it doesn't matter if it is terrestrial, forest, coastal, or marine. 
uh, but we are talking about coastal ecosystems that have much higher carbon burial rate uh, compared to the terrestrial terrestrial ecosystem and that carbon that is stored in coastal ecosystems is a blue carbon. Mm -hmm. um, so the carbon, carbon in these ecosystems is stored in the in the soil, which is the brown color on this graph, uh, compared to uh, living biomass, which is the the green color um, in in the graph, and you can see compared to the terrestrial forest, uh, much more is stored in living bi biomass compared to the terrestrial forest. So that is important when you have about eighty percent in terrestrial forest in the living biomass and on about twenty percent in the in the soil, and when there is a fire or they cut down the forest, 80% uh, of the carbon is just re gets released back into the atmosphere. Uh, for mangrove, um, and we'll see later on for the sea grasses, the, the things are a little bit different. In mangroves, about 30 to 40% is stored in living biomass, and 60% is the sediment. And when you cut down the mangrove forest, um, much less carbon gets immediately released uh, from the living biomass, while 60% that is stored in a sediment gets slowly released into the atmosphere, the water and the atmosphere. Then for the seagrasses, um, the proportions are even much smaller, um, that where 98% is stored in the sediment and two or less than 2% is stored within the plant. And when you remove the seagrass, a lot of it, uh, only 2% gets immediately released into the water or atmosphere. And 98% gets slowly, slowly released uh, from, uh, from the oxidation of the sediment. If we look at um, the blue carbon science from the region, these, uh, this is a recent systematic review that um, I did with several of my colleagues from the region. Uh, we looked uh, where, what is the current status of the blue carbon research science in this region. And uh, we saw that Indonesia, India and Indonesia are le definitely leading in number of publications uh, for the mangrove forest. But for uh, sea grasses, again, Indonesia is leading, uh, followed with Thailand. So with 31 and 29 publications. And then we have, so we know definitely for sure that the seagrass data is missing. The blue carbon seagrass information is missing for a major majority of the countries. You can see, for example, Myanmar doesn't have anything or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka. And yeah, so countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka or Timor-Leste, they, they don't have any records about blue, uh, seagrass blue carbon in their countries. Um, so this is just a list of when we look in terms of the carbon stock, so how much carbon is stored within the plant or within, this is within the plant and this is within the sediment. Uh, in what countries this number, the, these numbers that are verified, verified from the field is not available. So you can see that for mangroves is just Timor-Leste and Brunei, uh, but then for seagrasses, it is majority of the countries that we are missing. Um, however, they exist in global or regional articles um, when they published a global review, but then these, um, these estimates are most, li most likely uh, modeled um, and they don't, really, they don't really represent the real situation on the field and they over or underestimate the stocks uh, because when we compared it with the, the stocks that, are re that have um, field verified data, it's usually highly, highly overestimated. Hmm? So don't trust um, those values. You can use it as some kind of baseline, but don't, don't fully trust it. Hmm? Um, for greenhouse gas assessment, um, the you can see that most of the countries don't have any of it. Uh, so when we are talking about um, CO2 flux, is not available in major, most of the countries, even for, for seagrass, for uh, mangroves only in some countries. And then we are when we are talking about methane flux, 
it's even less it's even it's even more limited uh, compared to the other so when we talk about blue carbon it's not only stocks that we are talking um you should we should measure and the fluxes of co2 so how much of carbon is coming in into the ecosystem and how much carbon is re being released um, but also in methane because methane is the important greenhouse gas um that re that when it gets released it reacts with the oxygen and then instead of one molecule methane you have nine molecules of co2 so those are the important gases that definitely should be measured but we don't we still don't have any any data on this um we also looked where uh, most of the type sites uh, for seagrass and mangrove forest but we'll just focus on the seagrass here where the studies have been done. And you can see it's very, very few selective sites. Um, you can see the most is 12, uh, 12 number of sites per studies per location. Uh, the most of them ha have been occurred in Thailand um, with 12 um, in, in uh, this area of Andaman area. But the other sites are very few and very scarce spread out um, and definitely do not represent the regional the regional overview of the blue carbon status and also the seagrass. But when we look in the mangroves, you have some countries uh, like for example Sri Lanka or or the Vietnam coast. Um, also Philippine coast that are very well represented and have data across um, large spatial uh, large spatial area and have a good representation of the real situation of the on on the ground. Um, we also looked how good the data is so that in terms of the data quality and we divided it into high data quality, medium and low. Um, where, um, and, and then we grouped it for carbon stocks. So we just look the left side for the seagrass meadows. For the carbon stocks, um, CO, uh, carbon dioxide flux, uh, no, sorry, this is carbon burial rate. So how much carbon is being buried in the sediment and mapping. Um, and based on that, we assessed how good the data is that we that is currently published and you can see the the gray is not available uh, so for example the carbon burial rate uh, for many countries is not available thailand has single site single study uh, and it's a high quality study but it does not represent it's it's just a single study it doesn't represent a good overview um, of the whole seagrass meadows in Thailand. Um, when we look at the stocks, the situation is very similar with some of the countries having really high, good high data quality, uh, followed by the medium um, quality and the, low, the lower quality. And when we look um, the the seagrass mapping using rem various remote sensing tools, uh, only some countries have have nationally mapped uh, seagrasses like uh, like Vietnam and Singapore and India, um, and they know their total area of the seagrass, um, which is very which is highly important when um, you do in the blue carbon when when you want to assess um, the blue carbon status on the national level, you need to know the total area. Of the seagrass. So that is definitely missing in many of the countries right now. Um, and based on all of that, we made several recommendations that uh, there has to be some more emphasis on the sea on the seagrass meadow research in terms of the blue carbon. Mapping newer mapping technologies must be used, um, not only the satellites, because we know that it's some of some of the countries like Indonesia and Philippines have so many islands um, and so many different types of water quality. So the use of satellites might not be only 
it might not be the best, but then when we combine it with um, other methodologies, it, they might uh, they might contribute more uh, to develop a better understanding of seagrass area. Um, there has to be a spatially balanced research, so we don't have only single location and a single study for some of the some of the uh, some some of the the assessments. And I haven't talked about it here, but you can go and look into the paper. Um, a lot of studies they haven't used standardized methods, um, even though. The methodology exists since 2014. A lot of the studies haven't have have not uh, properly used it, um, and um, the estimates that were produced in the publications were so different compared to what the real situation should be. And again, we should definitely uh, work towards data sharing um, as we can contribute to much more um, on the global level. One example would be uh, Carbon Coastal Atlas, where you can upload your data, you can send your data there and they will upload it on the map and it will be uh, freely available for everyone. Um, if you look in terms of the global stock variability for our region, uh, we are just after uh, West Africa. So Australia currently has the highest uh, stocks available in the whole country, followed by Mediterranean region, then West Africa, and then Southeast Asia. Um, so we are, we do have a large, large amount, large amount of carbon stored in the seagrass ecosystems. So this is just the seagrass ecosystems. Um, but um, again, as I mentioned, the area of seagrass is not fully known. Uh, so this number could vary, could be lower, could be higher, depending on uh, what we do in terms of the seagrass mapping in the future. And um, that, repre that represents about uh, one to, to between one to five global, global estimates of the total blue carbon, um, depending on on the area that we are looking. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so in Thailand, we wanted to know the variability of the carbon. So as I mentioned before, we a lot of the studies are focused to a single study, so we don't look at the variability, how it varies from, from one coast to another coast. Um, if we have in different regions, we have different combinations of seagrass. We have reef associated seagrass, we have seagrass in shallow sand or bottom, and we have seagrass that are nearby mangrove area. But also we have different historical trends of the seagrass. And our seagrass, they belong to different biogeographical realms. We have Central Indo-Pacific and Western Indo-Pacific, and they are divided uh, with the land um, I don't, they don't really ever touch because it goes all the way to Singapore. So we really wanted to see the variability of the carbon stock within all of these meadows. So first we found that definitely the highest carbon stock was in the mangrove associated, which was expected. Um, but the unexpected thing that the, the, the carbon in the surface the top 20 centimeters was the highest in the reef associated meadows, meaning that in the first 20 centimeters, um, the seagrass meadows nearby reef, they collect much more carbon compared to mangrove. But the thing is, we they don't they the it just stays there between on the top 20 centimeters. It does not consider a long-term carbon pool. And it could easily get washed away with one storm, low high and low tides, um, rougher winds or um, or waves. That carbon is not stable for a long period of time. When we looked about historical trends, the stable meadows had definitely the highest the highest carbon stock across different years, while the meadows. Um, that are decreasing across the years had much lower carbon stock, which again was um, expected. Um, as the seagrass is decreasing um, every year, then also the carbon is also decreasing with it. 
And when we looked in terms of the area um, of our coastal regions, we have Upper Andaman, uh, which is this region here, Lower Andaman, Gulf of Thailand, and East Coast. Uh, we haven't collected actually data from the East Coast because it was COVID and that whole area was not allowed to go. <laughs> Um, they had really out, really bad outbreaks, so we couldn't travel. So we focused mostly on the southern area. Um, and Upper Andaman has the highest uh, carbon stock, followed by the Lower Andaman and then Gulf of Thailand. Even Gulf of Thailand is one big bay, and we kind of expected to have higher carbon stock, but it actually had the lowest. So that's where, why the spreading out and collecting the variability across different settings, across different geomorphologies, uh, meadow types, and so on are important because you want to get a real picture uh, and a real understanding what is really happening um, in, in, in what is really happening in blue carbon, in the seagrass in your area. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also looked in terms of the blue carbon connectivity. Uh, as I mentioned, we have reef associated mangoes and uh, mangrove associated metals. This is this was the example from a few years ago. Um, in the reef associated metals, we know that um, seagrass metals uh, contribute between 11 and 28 percent of carbon in the stock um, of in the area. Um, 16 to 26 percent of the carbon is actually coming from halimida, from seaweed, and 11 to to 11 to 18 percent is coming from corals. So we can see that the connectivity is definitely important, um, and but not a lot of carbon is um, not a lot of carbon in these kind of meadows is being produced from the seagrass meadows. From the mangrove associated meadows, about approximately 40% is, uh, is coming from the seagrass meadow. And for the mangrove, from mangrove carbon coming into the seagrass is between 13 and 66%, depending of how big the mangrove area or how close the seagrass was to the mangrove. Um, so you can definitely see that it's that we are we have to be not looking only at one one ecosystem, but because they are open and the tide is connecting these ecosystem that the connectivity is definitely reflecting on the blue carbon and that we should be looking into multiple ecosystems together, not as a single one. And currently we are working on a project uh, where we are looking um, into different, uh, so we expanded it from only from only um, a reef associated to add the macroalgal carbon from halimida and sargassum, and also the combination of macroalgal carbon with the mangrove and seagrass. So we are looking how the carbon is moving when you have more complex ecosystems, um, and um, yeah. So this is the current project that we are working on. I don't have the answer yet. <laughs> Um, however, uh, our, however, seagrass meadows in Southeast Asia are definitely threatened. Uh, from the literature review that I gathered, um, I, we calc I calculated that they are declining about 2.8% per year. Um, but the recent study um, estimated that, that um, the seagrass in Southeast Asia are declining 4.7 per year. Um, however, you can see that some of the meadows um, in Thailand are increasing, but in flu slides, you will see that it's completely opposite. And again, a lot of information is missing from Indonesia as well from the Philippines. So this number could be potentially higher. Uh, from the global studies um, in tropical Indo-Pacific, the seagrass meadows have a steady decline. But again, there is a huge lack of data uh, from this region um, that I that I I wouldn't really trust this line <laughs> of a decline. Um, uh, but it 
I mean, the trend is showing that, that there is a decline, but then because the data is so scarce that it's probably much steeper uh, and much lower. Mm -hmm. So the threats to the seagrasses um, in the, our in the Southeast Asia are coastal development, sedimentation and runoff, destructive fishing, and aquaculture. Um, and they have been the same for the last 30 or so years. Um, as you can see, some of the papers are from 1995 and they identify these threats. And the threats, the these threats are still identified in the last publication. Uh, so nothing really changed in terms of the seagrass threats um, in the last 30 or so years. Uh, so what happens with the carbon here is from a carbon sink, sink when we remove it, the seagrass, uh, we have a carbon source where the carbon is being released uh, from, the, uh, from the, the sediment into the water and then atmosphere. Hmm. So in Thailand that we know, um, by the 1990s, Thailand lost between 20 to 30% of the seagrass area. And that's mostly because of the aquaculture, because they were making shrimp ponds in the coastal area. Um, but we know that uh, from, this is the example of Hajamai National Park, um, that some of the meadows remain stable. And this is one of the largest meadows in, um, in Thailand. And since the 1970s, this meadow has remained stable. This study done it until 19, uh, 2009. Compared to the other meadows, for example, Kolibong, uh, which is just further south from, from this national park. Um, and it is changing. It has some areas that are, um, that are declining, some of them are more permanent, uh, some of them are gained and so on. But we know definitely that between um, 2009 um, and 2014, that the seagrass, uh, uh, the seagrass, the Libong, um, the seagrass area at Libong was lost about 3.2%. Um, but then on the other side, on the East Coast at, um, for example, called Tarai, uh, the, there was a slight increase of the seagrass from 2006, 2016, 17. And in this site, um, there has been uh, conservation. They, the locals agreed and they, they, they um, put the poles around the seagrass area. Even the monks came and um, um, the Buddhist monks came uh, and put their their robes around it um, to mark that this is a highly important area and nothing should like no destructive fishing or or digging should be done. And from that small conservation efforts and uh, local tourism to improve the local knowledge and small planting, small restoration, there was a small increase of the the. the of the seagrass, which resulted in much higher, uh, uh, much higher um, sea um, biodiversity. Uh, recently, um, some of my lab members they did a crab study and food food web in this area, and that all they all increased since two thousand and six. So it definitely a small actions had much higher impacts ten years later. Hmm. So at Libong um, Island. As I mentioned, there are some areas that are changing. Some of them are more permanent. Um, so we divided um, in the area into um, enduring meadows, which is the blue, uh, blue, co blue color that remained the same for 20 years. We divided, um, the next one is yellow, which is transitory, which, which sometimes they occur, some years they don't occur, or they are seasonal. And then we have new area and permanently lost. So that was a seagrass, but now it's not anymore. Um, and you can see that seagrass, we all know that seagrasses are very dynamic, um, but some of the areas are permanently under seagrass. Some of them are more seasonal, but they, are, they, they always occur. Hmm. Um, yeah, this is when we divided across, across the years. Uh, the same photograph, the same picture as in the previous slides. And we coupled up that with um, the carbon stocks um, to see what, what the carbon is telling us. So we knew 
we knew how much the metals were changing across the years. So we wanted to see what is happening with the carbon. And we, um, we found out that at the beginning from 1990s to 2004, uh, a lot of carbon actually from, came from the seagrass and from terrestrial input. Uh, we looked into urban development. There were only a few houses then. So the urban development on the island and then nearby as well. There were only a few, um, few houses in that area. In the next 10 period from 2004 until 2014, that the urban development was much higher. Um, and they were cutting trees, they were building, they were expanding the village. Um, and you can see that, that that reflected that carbon was started to come from the mangrove forest. There is much less carbon from the seagrass. Um, and the carbon actually started coming from the, there is more carbon coming in uh, from, um, Particulated um, coastal particulated organic um, organic matter. So there is a combination of all of them coming in together, and the meadows. Um, you can see that my my picture on the picture here that the meadow is much smaller. So the meadow started to to decline a little bit between two thousand and fourteen and two thousand nineteen when this when the urban development kind of expanded to much higher areas, um, there was a huge shift in the carbon, the surface carbon, uh, where it mostly came from the mangrove forest and a slight, a little bit from, uh, from seagrass and which coupled up with a smaller seagrass area, uh, meaning that as the seagrasses were dying, uh, carbon was staying in, uh, carbon was being washed away from to the other, but some of the carbon is being trapped by the leftover um, seagrasses uh, from the nearby mangrove, because there is a huge nearby mangrove area. So we can definitely see the historical changes um, coupled with the remote sensing to, to give you a big reveal of what is happening um, in the ecosystem. Um, and this is the most current one, uh, the current status, when we talk about the current trends. Um, this paper, we are finishing it right now, uh, but we are talking about the enduring area. So the, the blue one, um, the blue areas here uh, that have been um, under the seagrass meadows as far as we can remember. Um, it, these are the drawn pictures. Um, so we have the drawn, we collected the drawn pictures from several years ago. Um, we can know, we know that in 2018, we had very dense and halos, very dense mixed meadows. And this is the mixed seagrass we really together with halos. The same situation is very similar with some areas being more sparse. In 2022, we can see that in halos, this area here is completely gone. We just have mixed area. Our short, our sparse and hails became short leaf. So instead of having the leaves 20, 30 centimeters, they became this short. And then last year, end of last year, um, instead of the mixed meadows, there was very sparse halophila. Instead of short leaf, there is just dead rhizomes. And then some of the areas, there is no seagrass at all. Um, we wanted, uh, yeah, the same the similar situation. Actually, we looked at the the Hajama, Hajamai National Park. Oh. Can whoever has the microphone? Okay, just muted the Melita. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the similar situation is happening at Hajamai National Park. This is the same picture from before where we know that from 19, from the 70s, the seagrasses have been there. Um, in 2021, we had very healthy meadows with mixed species, combination of inhalos and halophila, and again, mixed species. And then in 2023, it changed to no seagrass, dead inhalos and very sparse halophila and just sparse halophila. So we are experiencing very huge changes, dramatic changes of the seagrass in just two, one, one and a half, two short years. 
um, we wanted with that, um, we wanted to look furthermore what is happening. Um, is it only localized to the southern southern area of Thailand or is it moving um, or is it moving up? We're not looking the 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 la the, the southern the southernmost province because there is very few seagrass there. Um, so we selected about seven sites um, along along the Andaman coast. Um, and you can see from this picture that it starts basically from the border of Malaysia all the way uh, to Phuket. And um, yeah, so I, I marked the, the Libong area that is supports the highest dugong population with sweet grass area. So I put in the brackets dugong feeding because later on you will just so you can remember. And then this is the Haja Mai National Park, which is the biggest uh, seagrass meadow, which is under under MPA. Hmm. So when we looked, we looked in terms of the quadrat change. Uh, we had the drawn images across several years for each of these seven sites, and we counted the quadrats that changed. Um, so the dark blue color is the quadrats that had no change. So it's seagrass to seagrass. Light blue is also no change. It's, it was sand and in the second year, it was also sand. The, the light red color is the loss of the seagrass. So it was a seagrass before, but now it is sand. And the green one, it was sand, but now it is the seagrass. So we just did a simple calculation and counted the number of quadrats. And we can see that the area that is under MPA and again, dugong feeding area have the highest number of quadrats that experience the change, the loss of the seagrass. So from seagrass, the number of quadrats that change from the seagrass to sand. Um, in B, graph B, uh, we have more in-depth analysis for one side of the dugong feeding area. Uh, we see that between 2008 and 2020, there was just slight change. Most of it remained as a seagrass. This is remained as a sand. There is one maybe quadrat or two quadrats that change from sand to seagrass. So it's a very stable environment. Um, but when we looked between 2020 and 2023, the situation is completely reversed. So we have a huge number I think it's about 47% of quadrats or about 50% changed from seagrass to sand and very few quadrats remained as a seagrass or as a sand, which as this is a dugong feeding hotspot um, is definitely going to affect um, the animals in the area. Hmm? We also looked for, besides the habitat change, we wanted to see what is the coverage change, how much the coverage changed in these, these quadrats. So under the MPA area for Komuk and, uh, and uh, Lam Yong Lam, which is that Hajamai National Park, um, the blue colors represent no change. So high debt, high coverage to high coverage, medium to medium coverage, low coverage to low coverage. The pink to red change changes represent the, the coverage that change it changed from the higher to lower. So high to medium, high to low and medium to low. And the green one is like a seagrass gain where it went from the medium, from a lower class to a higher. So medium to high, low to high and low to medium. So basically we are looking the red, the red or pink color, which represent the seagrass loss. And we can see in the MPA area for some of them, for example, this area here, um, it's about 90% of the quadrats experience the change of the coverage from higher to lower class. <laughs> Um, the Komuk area is also very similar. A lot of it has uh, represent the change uh, from higher to lower class. The dugong feeding area um, has the same trend where at a dugong tower, there was a lot of changes from a higher to lower class, but also at 
to hoi as well. So it's not only that the habitat is changing, but we also have the seagrass cover change. Um, that that it is changing. So definitely, there are some. There is something that is occurring to the seagrasses that is affecting it. So I am asking everyone here, um, what is the situation in your country? So this is the picture from actually Kolibong, start of my PhD. Uh, we did one project there. This is the short leaf and Kalos, and this is in November. So this exact it's exactly the same location. Uh, we have a GPS coordinate. Um, and this is just what it happened in several years. Um, so if anything like this is, you have seen it, it is happening in your country, uh, please send, send me the email. I will leave my email later on. Um, and then we, because we don't know if it is happening only to Thailand or it is a regional trend or uh, especially the countries um, in our area, so like Malaysia, Singapore, in Indonesia, or even Myanmar, if there is anyone from, from these countries, just if you have seen something like this, just please let us know. Um, so I'm going to go back to what is happening to the carbon when we have these kind of um, uh, changes of seagrass. So no matter what kind of threats um, are coming to the seagrass, are they indirect threats or they are direct threats, um, they all have a negative, they can all have a negative impact, um, not only to to the seagrass itself, but also to the carbon. So we have, we can have um, uh, canopy the canopy loss and soil disturbance, for example, from anchors um, and and scars, uh, but also uh, a slight dec a decrease um, of this of gradual say gradual decrease of the seagrass, uh, which will result in a canopy loss. So all of that is leading to increased um, increased soil er erosion. Uh, which is eroding the carbon that is already being stored, uh, remineralization of the carbon that is currently stored, so loss of it, so that is going to affect. So it's not going to stay in the, the, the sediment, it is leaving the sediment into the water and then the atmosphere. But it's also losing, we are losing the, car the carbon sequestration capacity. So there is no more carbon sink that will trap that carbon from the from the ocean or the atmosphere. And um, one of my PhD students, he's still working on it, but this paper just came out. He looked at it into the patchy seagrass. So the, the seagrass that started to degrade, uh, so they're not in a continuous meadow anymore, but they started to become smaller and more patchy. So he wanted to see what is happening with the carbon there. And um, we did uh, small chambers and we did in Thalassia, Hempichia area and Halos and in the bare sand. And we can definitely see that, um, this is the overall, that, um, the, the, that in Halos and Thalassia and then here as well. Um, so this is a different sampling time, sampling periods. Um, and this is across the species on, or the treatments that for inhalos and thalassia, this one and this one, and then the, the red and the blue color, they, they have net um, community production much higher compared to the bare sand. So this one here and this one here. Um, and they are still acting, even they are patchy and they are small, they are still acting as a carbon sink. Um, so now, my PhD, PhD student is working on further seagrass loss degradation and what you want to see what is happening to the carbon um, under those conditions. So, yeah, so they still act as a carbon sink. Um, so, us so usually when you have a complete loss, the carbon is coming out. So we are looking right now, or student is, my student is, I think he is here, uh, looking uh, where, uh, where, um, he, where, how much of carbon is coming out, or what is the threshold? Um, is it when all the seagrass is gone, um, or you have some degree of degradation of that the carbon is already starting to to leave um, the sediment? Um, in two thousand and one, we did a rough calculation 
um, of the potential emissions um, from the loss of the seagrass, from the loss of the seagrass. So we calculated that ap approximately up to 2.6 teragram, um, if we continue to lose the meadows with the current rate, this much of carbon um, will be emitted into the, the atmosphere, which is additional half million cars. So we have this many cars, so additional half million cars on the street. Um, and we are looking into the, the lack of up to 7,000 gigagrams of sequest carbon sequestration per year. So that much we don't have any more to, to, to um, absorb the carbon. Hmm? And that comes to the much very large economic loss of the value of the seagrass ecosystems up to 27 million USD dollars. So that is this, this pathway. Um, if we continue with the current decline, um, decline is definitely much higher now. Um, so these numbers are would definitely be much, much higher. Uh, currently. Um, but we also looked into what happens if we increase the area by 2030. So that when we did the study, which was in 2020, we had 10 years to do it. So we wanted to see what will happen if we increase um, the area of seagrass area by 30% by 2030. We roughly calculated that um, seagrass meadows actually can contribute between 6.5 and 7.2% uh, percent of the carbon emissions for the country's um, goals for carbon reduction. Uh, so these are just the current goals um, in terms of the seagrass restoration, global restoration uh, projects for the mangroves, tropical forest, peatlands, and seagrass. So these are the current declarations for restoration or how much each country should be improving. Um, and if you looked, we looked the carbon burial and uh, we wanted to see how much each country can rely on coastal ecosystems in terms of the restoration. So for example, Thailand, a lot of it can come from the mangrove, a little bit from um, seagrass meadow. Uh, much more can actually do come from the, in the Philippines, a lot of it can come, actually the carbon can come from the seagrass meadows. Um, in some countries like Indonesia, a lot of carbon actually can come from the peatland forest. Um, so the combination of all of these um, ecosystems will definitely have the impact the re on the regional um, targets for climate change. Um, and they it comes to the the potential of these ecosystems um, uh, for mitigation uh, of climate change, where we if if we see business as usual the the decline, if this is a natural fluctuation, we even we see the the decline of the seagrass meadows. But if we follow um, the additional sauce planting and conservation, uh, we have the additional stocks. So besides this area here, we have additional stocks from here, this area, or this area. It doesn't matter if we, oh yeah, so increase of the area. It doesn't matter if we came through the conservation approach or restoration approach, um, as long as the, the, the meadows remain there and they are kept stable. Um, however, if, uh, we continue base lab business as usual, um, we definitely have a decline of the area where we don't, we have, um, where we also have um, loss of the carbon, but loss of sequestration capacity. Um, and then under restoration, we, under restoration projects, we only have new accumulation coming in. Um, so the combination of these two in terms of um, adding into the, the, the potential of these ecosystems um, is beneficial. So not only focusing on restoration, as in restoration, you only have the new accumulation. So in here and here, which can take up to five, six, 10 years. 
But if we follow up with the conservation, we are conserving this area here that already has established the carbon cycle and the carbon burial, uh, but we are just saving it. Um, and that comes, and so this is from um, from Peter McCready um, slide. I think I think several uh, months ago he gave a talk uh, with you, Sarah. Yes, so I just correct. borrowed. Yes, yeah, so I just borrowed his slide, but I will come um, to 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 um, to our region. Um, but he they did um, they looked at the global overview, the potential um, of mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrasses. Uh, what is the potential globally in terms of avoided emission of if we save these ecosystems, how much countries can rely on? And you can see in the Sigra, in um, the Southeast East, Southeast Asian region, it's very high, uh, especially Indonesia. Um, and if you looked in terms of the ecosystems, um, the combination of avoided emission restoration yields the much higher potential than just focusing on one, one pathway. Um, but then, as I mentioned, I will look into the the uh, the regional countries. Uh, so each country um, has signed nationally determined determined contributions for Paris Climate Change Agreement, where by twenty thirty uh, they establish their business as usual usual emissions, and based on that, um, they calculated, uh, yeah, uh, based on that they calculated out how many how much emissions they want to reduce. And in more recent years, they, I think all the countries in the region, um, they set the target that they want to go to net zero by 2050. And I think um, 2030 would be, uh, yeah, I think for every country is different. So let's just focus on the net, net zero emissions by 2050, which is all greenhouse gases. Um, so if you look each country individually, this is what we are looking looking at, it's the target range that has to be reduced by 2030. Um, so this is the paper from 2017. Some of the NDCs have been updated. So some of it is higher, some of it lower, uh, but there is no publication that this nicely puts it. Um, but um, yeah, so some of the countries have smaller percentages of uh, CO2 emissions that they must reduce. Uh, compared to, for example, Philippines that have very high values that they agreed to reduce. But if we incorporate um, seagrass and then additionally mangroves to that, they can contribute six to 7% to these targets. I'm looking at it, six to 7% is not a lot. But when you when you are adding on the other ecosystems that have much higher area, like mangrove forests or even terrestrial forests, um, it can easily add up, and um, you can easily offset this area, um, this this emission. Um, however, we are talking about the most poorly represented ecosystems as one of the nature based solution, um, and not not really but not not a high potential is giving a priority to these ecosystems um and in many countries um, blue carbon and um blue carbon is already mentioned into their their ndcs um or either as a mangrove or as a seagrass. Um, and you can see in the map here from fair carbon, many countries already mentioned something in terms of the blue carbon. Uh, but the problem is, which is really good, I'm hoping that many countries will expand, um, will have, will expand from here. Um, but the problem is they know very few countries have specific targets. So they are mentioning blue carbon, uh, but they're not saying, "Oh, we want to we want to conserve this 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 area, or we want to plan this area, and we're expecting to get this much of carbon that can potentially." So they don't have really specific targets or pathways which we want to to use that blue carbon, um, except for Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka has a specifically designed. Um, uh, 
uh, goals uh, where they want to you how they want to use uh, uh, sea grasses and mangroves how much they want to plant how much they want to conserve and so on um, so I think definitely we can uh, I think Costa Rica has also a good example but I as I focus on in the region Sri Lanka is a good example um, but they are providing definitely a good um, roadmap for the other countries to follow up um, yes, and we should definitely not forget that um, sea grasses, they can also serve as adaptation measures for climate change. With the sea level rise, the sea grasses reduce uh, the storm surges, but they also increase um, the sediment elevation by about 31 millimeter per year. Um, again, this varies um, regionally um, and locally, but um, 31 millimeter per year um, in this region, I think it's uh, more than enough to um, um, uh, to follow up with the sea level rise. And of course, we shouldn't forget that they are providing food and livelihoods for many people living in the coastal areas. And it is expected that uh, more than, I think about uh, that will that the coastal population will increase in the next um, next few decades by um, 25 or 30 <clears> percent. <throat> so definitely these kind of things will be um, very threatened. <laughs> um, so as we are mentioning the other ecosystem services um, and other benefits from these ecosystems, they don't only contribute on a global level to Paris Climate Change Agreement, but also sustainable uh, development goals. So they fit in into, under many SDGs. They also fit in under Ramsar conventions um, and also for a convention of biological diversity, uh, which just finished COP last few days ago. Um, so these ecosystems definitely fit in uh, into many international goals that can um, that can move the country uh, not only for for the climate change but also sustain um, sustain their uh, global di their biodiversity targets. Okay, so I'm coming back uh, to 2018 paper, uh, which basically the outlines the conservation obstacles. Um, since 2018, no, up to 2018. Um, and you can see that um, a lot of it is still there. Um, even though we have, we are increasing um, number of researchers and we are doing a lot of capacity building in the region, there's still some lack, but I put a tick mark because we are working on it. Um, the limited scope of work definitely changed, so we don't have uh, we don't have a descriptive work or qualitative work. Uh, we have synthesis of of seagrass knowledge across large scales or across na nations and across regions. So we definitely moved up from there. Um, so there is a, there is um, uh, moving on. <laughs> uh, in a good direction, um, but a lot of it is also not there yet. So for example, we still have a lot of gaps in basic knowledge in many countries, management efforts. It's, I, I, I am still waiting to see a good example of the seagrass management um, in this area uh, that can serve as a good baseline for uh, for future as a future reference uh, environmental laws also I, I you saw that on the area of seagrass under MPA um, changed a lot <laughs> um, and it's most likely not not anthropogenic but uh, it could be a part of it uh, we still don't know and then there is again socioeconomic and cultural disconnect. Uh, we are still we are working on it through um, through capacity building and social awareness. But then in many areas re or areas in this region, there is still lack of it. Okay, and as the last one, I just want to advertise to everyone that we have a postdoctoral fellow. Um, we are looking for a postdoc um, in my lab. Um, 
as I think in one of the previous slide, in one of the earlier slides, I, sh I show that we are looking the blue carbon connectivity into several, um, into of several connecting, um, several connecting ecosystems. So mangroves, seagrasses, macroalgae and corals. Um, so we are looking a postdoc um, to help us with this, with this work. Um, so the application is until November 20th. You can reg you can scan this QR code and register there. We'll have the interviews on the 1st December. If you have any questions, you can send a, send it to, to my email. Um, but I'm putting it out there. <laughs> Since we are looking a postdoc, uh, this was a good opportunity to share um, this with everyone. Um, also, pretty soon, uh, my lab will have the opportunity for intern internships and new students for both master and PhD uh, opportunities. Um, you can look at it. You can follow us on our social media. Um, we are everywhere, <laughs> and uh, usually, most we usually we post um all. Of the announcements like for postdoc on our social media so you can uh, you can follow there if you are interested uh, in the future to be part of our lab and our work but you can also send me the email if you would like to anyway that's it for me um and i am open for all the questions <laughs> Alisa, thank you so much this was very uh very thorough very informative um i wish we were a little happier um oh. but um and, and again um can you and everybody can see Melitza's um email address if you have if you have any reports you can make on the seagrass in your area in southeast asia um she would appreciate knowing about that so i just wanted to point out that your your email address is available for that too um we'll we'll do a couple of the questions we um yeah before we stop, um, we'll start with some that came in earlier in the webinar. There was one, um, let's see, I'll go back. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Emily, it's a great talk. Um, my question is, how do you determine how many cores can represent an area of interest? Because each core within an area can have different carbon values. Yes, so um, we usually do at least three replicates, depending on how large of the area we are talking, um, what we are sampling. So at least three replicates, and then we try um, to get it because we want to have a representative view. Uh, so we try to get it in, from um, the area that is pretty consistent. Um, so if you have a large seagrass meadow, uh, we are trying to get in the middle of it and then um, have the cores in one line uh, or parallel to the shore, or it can be a perpendicular, uh, but mostly to represent uh, the represent to have the same representation across uh, all cores. Hmm. Um, if you are looking into more detailed view, um, I did for my PhD in terms of the species composition or the density or the coverage, then you can have more detail and more cores spread out. Uh, but if you're looking just the overview of all of your seagrass, just try to find a good representative uh, of the species combination to, that is equal through all of it, all the cores that you are taking and have at least at least three 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 cores as um um as replicates okay thank you melissa and there was a request if you could go back a slide yeah oh wait why is it not going okay hmm. how far uh just just one slide i think it, for, for oh the, for the postdoctoral fellow position. oh this one okay yes okay <laughs> all right thank you um and then um another question that came up um Let's see. Was does overpopulation of green sea turtles in a region uh, pose a threat to seagrass ecosystems? Uh, okay, <laughs> it is debatable. <laughs> um, definitely, it contributed towards the loss that we are having right now uh, because we are seeing a lot of the 
the the uh, the seagrass that have been like chopped off, like just cut. Those are the turtles that are eating it. Um, so there is a there are definitely contributions. I don't think they started it, uh, the the seagrass loss, but they are contributing. Um, in it is definitely one of the factors that is contributing overall to the changes and loss. Thank you. Um, a question that it came in earlier about mid presentation, which was what spatial data was used to collect the data for analysis. Oh, which one? Um, I don't remember exactly which slide, but I, w I was curious as to um, exactly what methods a lot of the data, I guess this would sort of address it, if you, what methods you were using for collecting um, some of the, the spatial data the, that you showed. Yeah, so um, we did, um, um so we did uh, two regional studies okay so the first one um i gathered um just longitude latitudes uh the information about the quadrats um and then i used the modeling um to um to see to estimate um the carbon stock um in the seagrass um and that is the earlier paper um i'm sorry I can go, I will go back to this one. Uh, that is this paper. Um, so we basically collected longitude and latitudes uh, of all of these uh, regions. So we send, send the data to the, all the collaborators that you know from the region um, and ask them to fill, uh, to fill the data sheet um, and collected all of it. But most of it, it was the focus on the, co the coverage seagrass coverage, species composition, and biomass. And from there, uh, we use the equations to estimate the carbon stock in the sediment. Um, that was the first one. And then the most recent one is the, um, the, 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 I think we're talking about this one or, yeah, this one. So this one, we just did um, a systematic review of all the area and all the papers. We didn't extract any of the spatial information from there. Um, we just looked at the sites and we kind of roughly, for, for each site, we kind of roughly estimated where they collected the core. So it doesn't have any spatial information specifically, um, but um, just the overall area. Hmm. Thank you. Um, someone did note earlier in, and, and this is just a note that a team in Malaysia has conducted seagrass blue carbon work that was carried out in 2021-2023 in several locations off the east coast of Johor and also in the Penang Straits. And uh, mm -hmm. the, a link was given for that. So. Oh, um, good. Mm -hmm. Oh, was it? Okay. Was it from... I think it was from the Iki project, um, were led by um, uh, the Australian government, uh, and uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. It is an wrong. Australian link, but I, I yeah, I don't okay, know. so so yeah. it is okay, so it is probably it is the same, um, because I know that they had a project in several countries. Um, they did Thailand as well, and um, one NGO from Thailand um, did the work. I haven't put it in here, uh, but actually I went on the field and collected the data with it, but it will be good. To, I haven't seen the reports from Malaysia, so thank you for that. I will check it out. <laughs> Great, and the link is in, in there for you. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll, go, we'll get a couple more questions, but I don't think we'll be able to get it to everything, but perhaps um, we'll be able to respond to some of them later. Um, let's see, what role do associated biota like turtles and dugongs play not only in augmenting the productivity of seagrass areas, but also in the blue carbon dynamics, including transfer across associated habitats? Um, so I, we haven't looked at specifically, um, but I know that other researchers from the globe um, are looking into that. Um, I'm not really an animal expert. 
uh, no one from my lab here um, is here that is a uh, dugong uh, expert. Uh, so I don't really know how much they, they are contributing to in terms of the blue carbon. I know that they, the, um, the grazing is in increasing the productivity, the same like uh, we have the cows eating the grasslands um, of the seagrass. Uh, but how much that is affecting the blue carbon stocks, I'm not specifically sure. Uh, for Thailand, for example, dugongs are mostly eating halophila, so the small seagrass. Um, and the stocks in halophila are very low. Um, and we just haven't looked at it yet. Um, I mean, th there's a lot of other topics that we haven't looked, uh, but... Um, it is this is one because uh one definitely it is one of the things that we are interested in expanding uh especially when we noticed um from last year or two years ago that the seagrass are being eaten uh, by turtles uh in large quantities and we are seeing the short leaf um in halos that definitely there is some something happening um my PhD student will is um, I think he is here. Um, he has one of his site um, has a short leaf in halos, which is being, which is kind of indirect um, eating by eaten by turtles, and he is looking into carbon. Um, uh, he's looking into carbon stocks and uh, CO two uh, emissions. So he will. He will, he, he's currently collecting the data. He's on the field. I think he joined from the field, but pretty soon um, he might know some, and he might have some answers to that question. Thank you, Melissa. Um, is there a correlation between high seagrass diversity at a site and level of carbon storage? For example, sites with mixed seagrass so compared overall, to homogenous seagrass? Yeah, well, um, it varies. Uh, it varies depending on what type of seagrass is there. Um, um, some of uh, some of the reports, um, even our one of our reports from from Thailand is saying, uh, in one area that if you have multi specific meadows, it has higher carbon stock. But then um, compared to mono specific meadows, but then for my PhD, I looked in halos, and then in halos with something else had a lower stock. Went on then compared to only in halos. So I think it varies from, in terms of the geomorphology and the combinations of species that you are looking at. So in some cases it might be higher, but in some cases it might be not. So. Thank you. Um, and there was another question, Indonesia and the Philippines still lack data information on the actual seagrass area and research has been focused on only a few locations. One of the reasons is the characteristics of the region, which consists of many islands and is difficult to reach. What are your suggestions to overcome this problem so that the gap can be filled and provide a comprehensive picture of the potential blue carbon coming from Southeast Asia? Yeah, we, we have the same problem. <laughs> Even we don't have many islands, uh, we still don't have a national seagrass map. Uh, we have a rough estimate, but we don't have it uh, fully mapped. Um, I have talked uh, with the colleagues from Indonesia. Um, they are gathering all the seagrass data that they have, um, and they are including modeling into their um, into of species distribution modeling um, into um, to produce uh, some kind of um, seagrass area, because even if you use satellites. Um, and you train a good model, uh, train a good, uh, um, train a good classification. Uh, you will you still because you have such a high variety of combinations and water quality. Um, you will have the areas that are very turbid, um, and brown with brown water, and the satellite will not be able to see anything. So that becomes a problem. Um, and. With this, even if you go on the field, unless you have a sonar and go up and down the coast, you won't be able to map it. Uh, but using the species distribution models might help you do it because they because if you have a good data set uh, of 
the current, uh, what whatever you have, you can put it into the model and the model will produce a potential habitat suitability. And um, you can go and check and that kind of limits, okay, the model said, uh, suggested that this is this area is suitable for seagrass. Uh, you can go and check it and see if it is uh, correct. Um, and um, that will help you um, in terms of not covering, not needing to cover all the area, but it will also limit, eliminate uh, the areas. Um, it will tell you in terms of the area where the water is very brown and murky and the satellites cannot penetrate. Thank you, Melissa. Um, we'll, we'll go to two more questions and then we'll yeah. wrap up. Let's see. Dear Melissa, thank you for so much for the fantastic talk. You mentioned we are still lacking in management efforts in the Southeast Asia. May I ask your opinion what we should do to move forward? And are there any good cases that we could reference out of Southeast Asia, perhaps? Um, as far as I know, uh, we don't have a good management uh, in term of, for the seagrass. Um, it is very variable because uh, it varies from country to country as uh, the land ownership and who is actually in charge of the seagrass varies. Because in Thailand, we have a Department of Marine and Coastal Ecosystem, uh, eco Ecosystems, and they are in charge for mangroves and seagrasses. Uh, so it's their department, unless it is under uh, marine national parks. So it actually, so it, we have different establishments and um, a joint management hasn't been established yet, which is a huge gap. Um, and having it, I mean, it will vary from country to country how it works, uh, but combining all of it, I definitely will definitely have a good a good representation of a management as long as you can have different stakeholders coming in together and having the discussion with, of course, the local communities because they are going into these areas. Um, they know it better than we do, um, and of course, got and. Um, with the compared to the government people, they will have more input. So having having all of them put together and sit and discuss and talk would be a good way forward. But we, I don't think we have we are there yet. We I think we are trying to to we are on the road. Um, we are trying to get all of the stakeholders together, but uh, I think it will take some a lot of effort and time. All right, thank you, Melissa. Um, and the last question, um, Melissa, thank you for the talk. Do you know what is the reason for seagrass loss in Thailand? For example, in Juhoi at the Dugong feeding spot between 2020 and 2023? Yeah, we don't know it yet. Um, we don't, we have some theories. Um, we have some theories why it is occurring like that, uh, but, um, but we don't know it for sure. Uh, we noticed that the seagrass, it, for example, Johoi has started changing uh, 2020, but not that drastically. Uh, but then the last few years have just decimated our seagrass. Um, the original theory was that the sediment was being dumped at the site, um, but it actually, so it actually started, so the, that was the original theory um, that it was just too much sediment coming into the seagrass. Uh, but then when it started moving north um, and expanding into the, the different areas, it definitely, it's it's not the sediment dumping because there is no, there the water column um, doesn't go that way. Um, so it couldn't bring the sediment. Um, Herbivory, plays one part um, in it, definitely. Uh, but then what it triggered, um, the huge losses, we don't know. They they looked at the diseases. Um, it's, I, I think they are currently looking right now. Another, our PhD student um, is looking um, into different contaminants into seagrass beds. Um, 
But as far as I know, none of it is too high to cause this massive die off. Hmm? All right. And with that, Melissa, thank you so much for presenting today. We have we appreciate all, uh, you sharing all of your vast knowledge on this subject and, and helping us put in perspective like what's known and unknown. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended. We're very pleased to have you today and we hope you can join future webinars. We have, hope to have more um, that are appropriate um, in, for your time zone. Um, and we hope all of you have the rest of, have a, have a great rest of your day. Thank you again, Melissa. Thank you, Zara. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>